Dr. Power, the guests have arrived. Oh, thank you, Bonnie Castle. Hi, folks. Come on in. Have a have a seat. There's room for two over here. So I'm so glad you joined me today. This is the first of our uh, smoke cat sessions for our our session. I, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, we'll have eight of these, and they form the discussions that we'll have in class. Not the only things we're going to talk about, but uh, some of the issues that we take out of the paper. And I have to take them today's a Wednesday, prior to the course start on Monday, so. We're a couple of days behind the actual, whatever the current status is of the stories we talk about. So build on them and add any other stories you'd like to talk about. Um, the smoke at sessions is something that uh, um, in, in Oxford, uh, uh, the Don, uh, the, the prof had chambers, sort of quarters, and you did readings there. You didn't so much sit in a classroom, but you'd come down and uh, the Don would have a small cluster like this of six or seven people around and uh, through uh, cigars and pipes and port and glasses of sherry, they would talk about issues like we're going to talk about today, and it's through the Socratic dialogue that we exchange ideas and challenge each other and test each other's hypotheses that we tend to get some firm terrain to stand on as uh, through critical thinking and reflective thought that uh, I'm satisfied with my position, I can defend it. And in this course, that's all we ask you to do. There's no wrong or right answers, just uh, have some good, hard, reflective thought, and if you're satisfied that your view of the hand is the right view of the hand, then, then that's where I want you to stand. And uh, it's the same on the exam. There'll be uh, uh, nothing I say to say that is the correct answer. As long as you can give me evidence-based support uh, for your position, um, you've, you've met the requirements of the course. Um, I don't want you to be overwhelmed with the course. Those of you who had a chance to go in and, s and do a quick scan of, of the vast array of materials in here, um, there's a lot. Uh, so go directly to the deliverables and see what you have to produce. Just that. That will get you your mark that you need to have a mark to, to go through the system. Anything else is bonus. And I had to design it that way. When the Pedro came to me and said, Terry, can you take this from a face-to-face -face class to, a, to an online class and keep the standard, um, I felt quite challenged and frankly wasn't happy about it. Um, I enjoy the face-to-face -face teaching and the Socratic dialogue and the interaction and the fast moving of, of a class environment. And it's hard to replicate that into an online situation. But having said that, not just personally uh, me working on it, but the, really a collection of a wonderful bunch of people like Bonnie Castle that, that just uh, announced your arrival and others uh, work hard every week to get these discussions to edit and to help me put in the course these rich materials. And I've done it deliberately in the sense that I've had a chance to scan your backgrounds, your bios, both cohorts, and it's interesting. We have such a, a vast array of... of Folks who are very skilled in strategy do it almost on a daily basis. Uh, terms like goals, objectives, visions, strategic inflection points. That language, that, language, that uh, lexicon will be well known to those folks. There are others of you that uh, I sense this would be rather new and uh, uh, there would be a bit of a ramp up curve to get to understand some of these terms and concepts and notions. And uh, so what I've done is said to everybody, Here's the basics in the deliverables. Do that. That's all that you're required to do. But for those of you that are already well down the road and becoming strategic practitioners, uh, I put a bonus section in there. And go in there and have a look. It's not required for the exam, but you'll find a whole bunch of rich things in there that may help you in your day-to-day -day job. For example, in the first session, second session, I guess, we give you a little red toolbox with about 40-some-odd tools in there that you use throughout the program and many in this course. But if for those in the bonus section, I put another 100 tools in there, another box. And uh, more than you'll ever need in your lifetime. But for those interested in strategy and have a passion for it, like I have a passion for it, go in there and have a look around. But the bonus section, you'll find rich with materials to, to look at at your pleasure. But uh, do a time appreciation. You need balance in your workplace, balance in your life. And as long as you use the deliverables, I'll be happy. Specifically, on the deliverables for these discussion sites, I'd like to make the point that all I expect from you is two meaningful posts in a week. Two meaningful posts in a week. That's not, hi, how are you, but that's reflective thought, adding some value, uh, some capital, intellectual capital to the class, and do that for us, and you've met, met the requirement. Um, that's not to say a number, I've had it in the past, will do 30 or 40 posts in the week, because they have a passion. They're enjoying the topic, they're enjoying the flow of the discussion, and I don't want to stifle that. I want you to do that. I want you to enjoy the course and get something out of it, and I'll work with you. Um, but for those that say, look, I've got other things to do and my time is quite tight, just give me two meaningful posts on the discussion sites and you've met, met the requirements. So that should be helpful in that regard. Um, critical correctness. Um, 
I challenge you a little bit on this. I, I tend to poke the bear a little. Um, I, there's no political correctness in this class, as long as we're respectful of each other. So we have Muslims in the class, and we have Christians in the class, and if we can't have this, this clash of civilizations, if we can't have these conversations in an academic environment, in a respectful, fair and balanced way, where in the world are you going to have these discussions so you can truly understand? I mean, for example, from an, if I held up my hand for, and asked you to describe what you see on this side of the hand, you'd probably say, well, an old arthritic hand of a, of a 73-year-old with the ring on it. But if I turned it around here and asked you to describe it, I think you'd agree with me. You'd have to describe it a little bit differently. And so that's what we have to do in this class, is we have to come around from this side of the hand that we view the biases, the way we perceive the world, and come around to this side of the hand and try to stand on that terrain for a few minutes and view the world and get a sense of it. And we're going to do that a lot in this class. Uh, that's the only way to establish this critical thinking. And indeed, you may even wonder why in a strategy course are we looking at these emerging issues? And it's because we need to understand the water in the bathtub. If we don't understand the, the, the what's about to emerge through the fog and mitigate the damage or exploit the opportunities these changes are going to make, in our strategy, in our businesses, indeed in our lives, um, then we are not doing our job and what you're being paid for. And most of you are being paid for one thing at your work, and that's to be strategists, to help lead your company. And so uh, we'll talk more about that as the course, course unfolds. Um, I think I've covered all the, all the points that... Uh, I wanted to cover, other than say that uh, I'm available to you. I'll work with you. Uh, I want you to have some time with your families, and I mean it sincerely. And this is not meant in my course to be a boot camp. It's meant to have some downtime on the weekends. But I accept there's a number of you working so hard during the week, you must do the work on the weekends to get through the course, and I accept that. But I'm saying to most people, I'll expect that it's Friday night. I don't expect to see you around on the weekends. I want you to spend some time with your families to do what you have to do but get some downtime and join me again on Monday morning. For those of you that have to work on the weekends because you can't get it done during the week, I'll be there, I'll be available to you and working with you on the weekends and doing some posts and answering some of your questions throughout the weekends. But as many of you as can, I do underscore the importance of you getting some downtime with your family because it's putting great stress on, on the family and on your children, those that have, it, have them, and uh, I want you to spend a little time with them. Uh, I'll be available to you anytime you want to call, uh, 250, make a note, 250 472-3836, 472-3836 in Victoria, and uh, um, I've got a better office at home than I have here on the campus, and so I tend to work on these online courses from my home for the, for the next eight or nine weeks, and so most of the time you'll find me at that number unless I'm in at my office here doing meetings and other work. Oh, good. Well, folks, that sort of gives you the basic introduction to some of the administrative detail for the uh, What's in the News and some other points I wanted to make. Uh, I apologize for the length of today's What's in the News because that sort of chewed up a lot of our time. Generally, these will run around 30, 35 minutes, and it's just highlighting, dance across top of the waves of some of the points that I want you to have a look at. So let's get underway if we can. And certainly today in the, in the Globe and Mail, and uh, I, as I commented earlier at the outset, let me comment that I find it hard these days to find some media that is not strongly biased but towards Plato or Aristotle, one pole or the other, particularly towards the left side of the house. So you'll find during the uh, materials, uh, I'll take some editorial liberty and fire in a little bit of the other side. Either way, it happens to work, just to poke the bear a little bit, but to give it more of a balanced perspective, because sometimes they seem to leave off some important points. So, U.S. drops the NAFTA demand for auto content on uh, Mexico and Canada, is in the paper today, worth looking at. And uh, if you recall, that was a strong point of contention, and both Canada and Mexico said, no, we're not going to do that, and uh, Washington backed down. And it was also interesting, too, on the steel and aluminum, you recall that situation there that threatened initially to uh, just almost destroy what's left of Canada's steel and aluminum and uh, by putting an additional 25% tax on it uh, on one of the... And, and uh, the result of that, of course, was uh, it's the way Trump negotiates. He comes and he asks for the moon from anybody. He shakes everybody up. And so people are more receptive to take the offer that comes and so he fired it out, he fired out this thing about the automobiles, etc. And now he's backing up on it. Um, but whenever you negotiate, a good negotiating skill is that no matter what the deal is, even if you're happy with the deal, uh, Trump will end up saying to you, uh, well, if I do that for you, if I uh, take the tax off the aluminum, then you have to do this for me. And uh, in this case, he's asking that the NAFTA agreement be wrapped up. Um, 
before the Mexican elections coming up and before the November elections in the states because the dynamics shift in the negotiating teams at that point, and uh, he senses he'll get a worse deal then than he might be able to squeeze out of folks today. But anyway, it's very important to Canada, important to your strategies, what happens to NAFTA and uh, the health of NAFTA, and so we watch that. Uh, in Ontario, the uh, Ontario School Board um, has got uh, not-for-profit and other organizations that take money from the Ontario Catholic School Board to sign a, uh, uh, an agreement that they will not support uh, activities opposed by religious doctrine. So we have the church involved in the schooling system, and uh, as a Catholic, uh, I confess my bias is, of course, that my kids all went to Catholic schools, they were good schools, but that begs the question as to what extent for those that are not Catholic, they should be subjective to um, some of the teaching, some of the pressures, some just the surrounding circumstances of the Catholic doctrine in schools, or that could be uh, the shoe on the other foot, it could be uh, from, from Islam uh, teachings in that, that area. So let's talk a bit about that if we can. Uh, one of the big stories this week, of course, and just on the surface, is Facebook. And I'm sure uh, I'm recording this on Tuesday. You don't see it till the following Monday, so I'm like six days behind the news. A lot will unfold between now and the time you hear this video. But there's a lot in here. One of the things we'll cover in this course is the Internet of Things. I call it everything because uh, it's more than just starting out on things. It, it's people, it's animals, it's everything is going to be linked to this This interconnectedness that we, we talk about. And with that, uh, I've asked you to look at a video early on um, that I made a couple of years ago on the Internet of Everything. And the dark side, stepping through the looking glass and the data sovereignty, data privacy, um, data security, and more importantly at this stage, data censorship that's taking place. And uh, we've had, I call them the four horsemen, almost get out of control here, and we're starting to see it snap back. So Facebook may be the catalyst that opened that up. And for those not familiar, the, the essence of it, a young man actually took some schooling education here in Victoria, um, moved to England, and uh, here we have the idea of Facebook agreed to something called the uh, uh, Cambridge Analytics that was a firm set up by Steve Bannon of uh, of uh, Donald Trump's team uh, back at the election time with the monies from a, um, what the gentleman's name? Um, I, right now, forget his name, but it starts with the letter M, I recall. But they threw some money at this, about a million dollars, to set up this app to get some data and information in. And what you have, Facebook, is, uh, is Google, is YouTube. They're all mammoth data collection uh, repositories of, of, of information coming in. And they're starting to sell and hide this off and get advantages of this. Um, we agree to it in this page after page. We agree when you click here for the app and nobody ever reads them. And so they're doing that, but it's getting to the point that they're crossing lines of, of the non of the Competition Act and things like that. And so we have a situation that Facebook did this agreement with the, uh, with the right-wing side of the house to get about 50 million names that they could send and target emails out to to support Trump um, and, and the election. Um, to Trump's credit, they closed it down prior to that, but never they started it off. But it has brought a whole raft of investigations and transparency, and people are pulling back the curtain. And it's not just this one thing of Cambridge Analytics, but the whole site now, they're going in to look at Facebook and, and this company and how they're dealing with each other, and they're finding a number of clients, um, both on the left as well, have been doing this. And so it's opening up a whole Pandora's box of brown little furry things, they're not gonna be able to get back in the box as they go uh, down that way. And so we have situations like uh, um, in Canada, our privacy commission, Daniel Tarrant, is, is looking at uh, um, this situation of a formal probe into Facebook is supposed to take place. Indeed, as a sidebar of that, uh, BC's a privacy commissioner, David Flaherty, I had a chance to interview, and he's up in the bonus section. If you're interested in data privacy and data security, he's in there talking a bit about it. You can have a look. But anyway, it's opening up the Pandora's box in Canada. The Privacy Commission is looking at it. In the States, they're opening up. Uh, the federal uh, folks are getting a look and they're issuing subpoenas to pull it together. And in Britain, it's doing the same thing. It was uh, interesting. In in Britain, the uh, um, it seems, I'm looking for the details here, but it seems that uh, um, Facebook immediately on Cambridge moved back in and started cleaning. You remember Hillary vote acid washing and cleaning. Well, they've been there cleaning, but the uh, the law has stepped in over there and says, no, get out, you can't touch the properties anymore because they need to preserve some of the evidence. The question is, is it too late or not? Because Facebook was in there cleaning as they, uh, uh, the site and picking up papers and one thing or another that uh, they may or may not have to use. Um, it also gives rise to watch for the spin in these things. That 
um, uh, they've got a lot of lobbyists that know how to do this, so they're going to get you to the Facebook story over here, and as the media starts to focus, they'll throw something up over here. And I noticed at the same time in the paper, Unrelated, Google has just announced a $300 million grant to uh, talk about cleaning up the, the, the sites more, to do some censorship. But then the question becomes, of course, who's going to be the censors? But it's all part of this data censorship, and these organizations are run away. There's no rules and regulations that were designed for today's Internet of Everything. They were designed for the industrial age, and those rules don't really apply or can't move fast enough to keep up with them. And we've done it before. I mean, we've taken companies before that got away. Uh, Standard Oil in the States grew into from a, a capitalist system. They did everything right, and they grew so powerful, they crushed everybody else. And a small little uh, oligarchy of... of leading contenders left, and that's what we have here. So it's not really capitalism anymore, they're almost monopolies, and so you have to break them up. And I think there's a strong movement starting to take hold, both in the states, and primarily in the states, but less, to a lesser extent here, um, that these things be looked at and be balkanized a bit into bite-sized pieces to allow the competition to get off the ground and truly compete and make the marketplace more competitive. So watch for that to take place, but they did the same with Ma Bell. They broke up Ma Bell about... Uh, 25 years ago into separate parts, and it took off and did extremely well. Uh, so have a look. But certainly when you have people that have a wealth, um, as I recall, the richest man, I think, was somewhere about $130 billion uh, of net worth. That's not the company. That's his personal bank account. Um, and, and compare that to the GMP of Nigeria, 185 million people. It's $6 billion. Six billion versus 130 billion, and you get some sense of the distortion, the gap between the rich and the poor. That become issues that we we look at. Um, Ottawa is having uh, consultations on systemic uh, racism. They're putting a 23 billion dollar envelope together to uh, put some uh, programs and studies in place. Uh, they want to talk in terms of particular bills going through about condemning is Islam Islamophobia uh, across Canada. That uh, the move against Muslims that. Uh, uh, Islam that uh, seems to be perceived. Um, gun dealers in Ottawa are going to start keeping track of gun sales. And depends where you are. If you're in the rural areas, where the decision makers aren't, but in Alberta and places like that, uh, farmers, uh, guns are second nature uh, to take care of the uh, uh, the critters on the on the ranch that are killing off the chickens. Uh, but if you're in downtown Ottawa, of course, uh, you're not sensitive or tuned to the need for a gun. And so uh, you're all too willing to put these rules and regulations in. America is stronger, of course. They have it as the uh, as uh, right within their uh, right within their constitution, the right to bear arms, and uh, like monopoly, the rules are the rules. In Canada, we don't have that majority rules, and we can change, unlike the Americans, quite quite easily. But it, it occurred to me that uh, as an old military fart, uh, guns aren't really the problem. Um, no more than spoons are the problem for obesity in 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 the, in, in the states. Um, it, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that, it's not the cars that kill, not the gun that kills, it's not the spoons that kill. Um, it, it's uh, other things. Um, there's more in here on the Wiley fell on the Facebook. Yeah, the Federal Trade Commission is launching its own study. There's a lawsuit in California on Tuesday that says Facebook misled investors and failed to disclose that it gave third-party firms access to users' data. Um, the company stock dropped 40, 40 billion dollars yesterday. Forty billion dollars, pretty significant. Uh, Facebook's in breach of the terms of a settlement that was reached on data privacy with the several U.S. media outlets uh, and the Federal Trade Commission earlier. Uh, in Britain, uh, yeah, here's the talk about the cleaning that went in there. The cleaning of the site. Zuckerberg's nowhere to be found. He's gone to ground. They've sent letters to him saying you'll answer these questions by March 29th or else. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there we can look at as this uh, unfolds, but it's not the symptom of simply Facebook. Zoom out for a few minutes and just consider all these marvelous new, this new world we're going into that we all sign up for and we all enjoy very much, but we're exposing ourselves. Our civil liberties and all these issues are, are lurching forward at us and uh, without protection, so we need to catch up with how fast they're moving. President Xi Jinping and states is, uh, in China is talking about the, the role of China. You recall that uh, recently the, they passed the... Uh, required papers in place for him to stay on for another eight years as the leader in total, and that's uh, like Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong, you recall, in 1949, at the end of the Grand March, uh, uh, with the Communist Party, takes over takes over China. Um, the other party, uh, um, Chiang Kai-shek and his folks, move off to uh, 
uh, Formosa, Taiwan, and set up there. And uh, time passes until about 1978 when the bamboo curtain comes down. And at that point, China lurches forward into uh, this brave new world. It economically becomes the engine for manufacturing globally. And it is now moving up so fast that in purchase power parity, it's larger than the states. In GNP, it's smaller. The GNP for China is just less than 12 billion. For America, it's just over 18 billion. But the gap is closing quickly. And so China's starting to feel it that there was a time in China's been around for about 3,000 years, and for most of that time, they considered themselves the center of the universe. They were called the Middle Kingdom. And everything from gunpowder to medicines to the Great Wall of China to books during the, the uh, two different dynasties, uh, they were leading on, on when well, we were still playing in the Dark Ages through the uh, after the fall of Rome, about uh, 472 AD, uh, up until about the uh, I don't know, 1472 in that range. It was complete darkness of uh, the Vandals and the Huns were destroying everything. There was no Western civilization as we know it, no books being recorded. In fact, they're being destroyed. In fact, it was the Irish. If you Google the Irish, how they saved Western civilization, it was only the monks in Ireland that managed to preserve over that thousand years dark time all the uh, information. So anyway, China is, uh, under Xi Jinping, is starting to feel its way again. It's becoming the center of the universe. The, 150 years, the period of humiliation from the colonial powers taking over Hong Kong, Macau, etc., um, are uh, disappearing in the rearview mirror. And China is exercising its power through its sea power, etc., into the East China Sea and, and the South China Sea. And this uh, road and belt system they're putting all the way from uh, the major cities in Beijing all the way over into the far reaches of Spain and down into Africa. Um, they're putting in these transportation systems and loaning money to these countries and spreading its influence all the way across. It's astronomical. It's going to really drive the engine and feed the engine of China as a center again and support this, this notion. So there's lots in there we have to say. In fact, when you're in your Google and looking at that, have a look at the uh, 16 plus 1, which are those nations that really were part of the Soviet Union and then became part of the uh, European Union. Uh, many are dissatisfied. Hungary and uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine, etc., are dissatisfied on the supports and things they were promised and didn't seem to be getting from the West. And so now China's coming through there with this uh, belt system saying, we'll give you money for roads and infrastructures and things like this. And they're taking that money and they're getting a nice, soft, warm, fuzzy feeling. And so China plays the system of go, unlike chess. In, in our world, we play chess and at the end of the day, the chess board is decimated, a few people have standing and if you capture the king, you're the winner, but everybody else is destroyed. The Chinese don't. They take the long game. She's in there for another eight years, so it's a long game of go slow, and the winner is the one who captures the most terrain, but they don't lose anybody. And that's what Sun Tzu says. The best commanders are the ones that don't lose any any forces. So it's a key thought. Uh, certainly this got Apple to go over there and set up with all sorts of uh, ripple effects coming out of that. Um, one of Churchill's paintings went for $87,000. Um, badly destroyed, but uh, certainly I'd love to have it. Um, not unusual. Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra also did paintings, and uh, they're out there. Uh, Trudeau, to his credit, 50% of his cabinet are women. Uh, for the second time in B.C., we're now going to have another female as our uh, new lieutenant governor, uh, Janet Austin. Uh, she worked for uh, um, non-profits, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. Oh, yeah, but YWCA. She was uh, the executive officer of YWCA and some other things. Uh, but anyway, she's taking over as our lieutenant governor in the province. That, uh, 30 fingers. Rachel Notley, the Alberta of uh, Alberta's premier. Um, interesting stuff in there. We've got this this tug of war between the feds and uh, BC wanting to get the uh, the pipe not B, not BC but uh, Alberta and the feds wanting to get the pipeline, uh, the Kimberley pipeline opened up, which comes down right through Vancouver and loads up the ships there to move the stuff out. Kim Kinder Morgan, uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, comes down uh, against BC that says, no, we don't want our, our concern. Uh, yes, we'd like to have the jobs, but we don't want um, that much oil going off our coastline and destroying it. It just takes one tanker to completely destroy this, this picture card place we have as BC. And so you have these conflicting interests of the, of the, uh, of the environment versus uh, the need for gas and bring the price of gas down, and uh, they're landlocked. They have to find some way to get their uh, get their oil off to to markets, and so it's uh, it's playing out before our ears. But here, it, it, the impact of this is going to impact on uh, Rachel Notley in the sense that uh, 
when uh, Klein was there in 2004, I remember he made the announcement. He was absolutely proud and pleased that he could announce that Alberta was completely debt-free, 2004. And when some notes in here caught my eye, that in 2015, Alberta's debt was $11.9 billion, and uh, currently it's $45 billion. And by the year 2019-20, which is two years out, it'll be $71 billion. I mean, that's not enough to destroy Alberta, but it, it's, it, the engines are starting to fire again. It's getting back up a little bit off the ground, doing some other things and trying to reposition a bit. But $71 billion from a standing zero owed um, and the election coming up, uh, you can see the pressure on her to get this Kinder Morgan thing open, to get the royalties coming in, some revenues, some cash stream coming in. And if she can't do it, it may uh, not augur well for her in the election. But it could be wrong. Let's watch for that and see. Peacekeepers going to Mali. Um, we're sending uh, six helicopters, four little fighting helicopters, and two of the uh, large Chinooks. Uh, basically, medevac uh, go over there to do it. But it begs the question as to the role of Canada and peacekeeping. Should we be back into the role of peacekeeping again? They've lost something like 100, 167 peacekeepers in that uh, country since it started. Canada has given other supports. We've given over a billion dollars of your taxpayer money to Malawi to, to, uh, to help out and do some warm, fuzzy things over there. But now we're sending 250 primarily air folks and uh, some supporting troops over. So it's a concern. And so should we, in, should we be in the uh, peacekeeping role uh, uh, in there? And of course, the reason we're doing it in large part, uh, although it's not disclosed here, is that there's the Security Council at the United Nations, and it's coming up for uh, who's going to sit in that, that vacant seat uh, that uh, they keep refilling every couple of years. And uh, Canada's got a good chance for that. So Trudeau is positioning the best he can to be supportive of the UN and do these sort of things in the hope and the expectation that Canada will get a kick at bat. But a sidebar for that, when the Bretton Woods Agreement took place about 1944, 1945, thereafter, when the war ends, and they're putting the UN together, um, Canada was and earned its place properly to be on that Security Council. We had the fourth largest navy in the world. We had paid our dues in the number of troops involved, and uh, we were considered a pretty major major power, both economically and militarily. And uh, But they said no to us and put uh, lightweights in instead on the Security Council permanent members. And we got pushed to the sidebar to, uh, out of there because there were too many Anglos already on the commission, and they wanted to balance the uh, balance the team. So it's uh, interesting. Toronto sees a drop in their sales of homes, um, and uh, same in BC. Uh, slowdown looms for a number of reasons: um, high interest rates, uh, modest unemployment growth, household debts rising, stress tests. You recall the government put in this thing, even though you borrow, put 25% down, and get a 75% mortgage approved. You still got to test yourself that if it went up two percentage points, interest rates could you still handle the debt even with a 20%, 25% down payment? And so, uh, the real estate market is uh, starting to uh, slow down a little bit. I don't see it as crumbling, but it certainly is a moment for pause. And again, they're talking here about uh, tech companies, uh, um, all the way down to Uber, have been lightly regulated, and uh, clever ways to avoid taxes and so antiquated antitrust rules. And so there's again, a lots in the paper about time for a change, new mental models on how we're gonna deal with them. Big Six Bank, I opened up my mail last night and I got this take it or leave it letter from the bank, uh, simply saying that you probably got them too, that basically your ATM charges and your bank charges, et cetera, are all now gonna be subject as of May 1st to these new rules. And if you don't like it, just uh, cancel everything and, uh, and it's not a problem. And so the, 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 all banks are common. Uh, your ATM machines, you probably noticed that the banking, that initially they were free, but now we're moving to a digital economy. Uh, they're starting to exercise that power over you because you've got to use your ATM machines you don't have cash in your pocket. And now they're going to start charging you more to use it. And so uh, the federal agency has stripped away any remaining pretense that banks are trustworthy providers of advice, assistance, guidance, help, or anything else along those lines. The Financial Consumer Agency of Canada said in a report issued on Tuesday that the corporate culture of the big six banks is sharply focused on selling products and services and that there's insufficient controls in place to protect clients from aggressive sales practices. And it goes on. And they come up with there should be a bank literacy test for you and I that would include the, the following in the curriculum. Banks are vendors of financial products, not advisors. The products a bank urges you to buy may not be suitable for your needs. Banks work primarily for their shareholders and not for their customers. For every product a bank sells, there's almost certainly a cheaper one uh, that's more customer-friendly and, and the alternative 
it would be available from an independent competitor. And so have a look at your bank these days, but maybe they too, like the media we're talking about, are getting too big for their britches and it needs a little more control and regulations to... Uh, somebody needs to speak for us, I guess is what I'm saying, just the consumer. And here's Google's pledge for $30, $300 million to aid publishers fight fake news, but the question becomes, who determines what's fake news? And there's been lots of stories to include the president of the states getting his Twitter account closed, that uh, um, their view of what's fake news and your view may be somewhat different. Um, China urges Trump to avoid a trade war, and uh, I don't think that Trump's looking necessarily for a trade war. Um, I think we all want free trade. The concern is when sovereignty gets transformed to a place like Brussels on our issues. When somebody gets control, like the, the Brits had to do, that they had fishing for centuries out there in the North Sea, and Brussels determined, no, no, you're going to give that up and allow, a, I forget the country, Spain or somebody to take your, your fishing rights. Uh, that was too much for the Brits. They had to pull back. article in here appealed to me. I don't know when I'm supposed to retire. And uh, it hit home. I had to look at it all. And basically saying you should leave it at your top of your game. Um, and I guess... Uh, we're coming to that, that sort of stage, but uh, interesting article, worth a laugh. Take a variety of papers. Uh, gang member stabbed team wearing a red sweater, a Victoria man. And here, a Vietnam gang in, in Victoria. Youngster, clean-cut young man, uh, not involved in any criminal underwear, according to this. Minding his own business, but made the mistake of wearing a, um, a long sleeve blue shirt and a red burgundy sweater on top of it. And at the party where uh, some Vietnam gang members took him outside and stabbed him for wearing a red sweater. And so it speaks to the, the need for cultural integration, immigration, education, and uh, just a concern, I think, for all of us uh, to keep Canada the way Canada used to be, if, uh, a little more civil. Nanaimo, a tent city for residents, evicted after raid approval. Um, tent city, if we gotta do somebody, there's a whole bunch of people out there that are on the ground every night through winter, through cold, uh, more in BC because the climate is warmer here than say downtown Calgary in the wintertime. But nevertheless, these folks are the downtrodden and have lost a lot of hope. And that number is going to grow as we'll find out in this course if we talk about the internet of everything. There's going to be more people moving to that end of the spectrum. And as we just, uh, not today, there's too many things to talk about, but as life unfolds, we're going to spend some time thinking about what are the solutions for this for the, the folks that find themselves unemployed and just step over on the streets. And we have some solutions that we'll talk about in this course. But uh, just have to keep your eyes open as you walk around your streets. Um, Canadian dollar has fallen in the last uh, three or four weeks, almost four percent, almost four cents, uh, from eighty eighty one down to seventy six. Uh, oil is doing well; it was sixty three dollars a barrel, and uh, we'll talk a bit about oil and sustainability of that price as time goes on. The Gulf snow crab in the Mediterranean, in, in the uh, Saint Lawrence Seaway, lost its environmental designation as environmental sustainable. Uh, because uh, they'd, apparently the fishing with the ropes and the way they harvest these uh, crabs have killed 17 uh, uh, whales. And uh, out of a small population of only 450, that's a significant impact. So they've got to start doing better. Uh, San Francisco is banning furs. Um, not too many people wear fur these days. Certainly when I go up, it was uh, everybody sort of expected you to have one. Today it's uh, frowned upon and cruelty to animals, and something I guess we all kind of support. But no wrong or right answers you'll find in this class. Trump and Putin. Putin got re-elected uh, for another term, and uh, um, we can question the type of election that took place, but nevertheless, Trump uh, um, called and, and uh, congratulated him, which is a normal practice. Many other world leaders did. But uh, out of that, somebody in his office leaked just that fast to the press to say that he'd made that call, and uh, scratch your head when that happens. But nevertheless, it seems to me that there's a Notwithstanding the, the field, if we, we don't have communications between each other, um, that's a bad situation. So even though we may not like each other, I think it certainly helps if we spend some time talking and communicating. And so I don't fault Trump, but you may. But worth a conversation, should Trump have called um, Putin and be working with Putin in the light of the things that Putin is claiming that, that he's doing on hacks? And I'm sure he's doing that hacks, but understand, in fact, on the bonus site, I've got a live hacking site, and you see the hacks taking place with the U.S. Uh, IP numbers going all over. And uh, Canada does it, the States does it, China does it, all countries are doing it and have been doing it. The cyber warfare taking place around your ears right now. In fact, well, it's taking place right now. And so uh, to single out and say Putin and for the Americans to feel 
greater than now, um, that's troubling because uh, certainly Americans are involved in most elections around the world, either directly or indirectly, giving money or sending in CIA agents or something to do it. So it's, uh, I was pleased that Trump made a call. Um, tanker traffic, we've talked about that. Tank issues. One of the mix I subscribe to is called Bloomberg's, comes out weekly. Again, a bit of a red, a little bias to it, but there was some good data in it. Um, four short little articles. One is the uh, is the strengthening of the Chinese currency, the yuan, and uh, it goes on and talks about uh, in here the the growth of that and it's a vehicle currency. The U.S. dollar has been the vehicle currency for the longest time, and that demand supply curve, but that's shifting. Increasingly, people are going to other alternative ways to uh, to trade oil or to uh, move currency around the world whether it be bitcoins or something else. And every time you do that, you destroy the demand supply curve and weaken the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, and so have a look at the U.S. debt, the debt clock's in there, um, and just have a, that sort of thing. And it says it's gaining momentum for uh, onshore financial markets that uh, they've increased the numbers in Vancouver. Um, they're now pricing their oil futures in their currency instead of the U.S. dollars. That's going to be impacted. Um, and what was the other great thing they're doing? Uh, yeah, the Belt the belt Road, all that import-export going along that way is all going to use the Chinese currencies rather than the U.S. dollars for trade between China and all these countries all the way across. And so spend some time looking at that. Interesting. More into that story, but I want to be respectful of your time, so I'm going to move quickly if I can. Um, oh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a bucket full of trouble, 3% of KFC's were closed for over a week in Britain because of the supply chain logistics. Everybody's going to lean management just in time, and uh, the chain failed. And so there was over 900 restaurants out of out of business for a week because of the supply chain logistics. So uh, as we go on, the importance of uh, supply chain management using uh, artificial intelligence and the internet of everything to get a hold of this. But what happens when it goes wrong? It, it, there's an example of it. Um, more things we should be worried about is that automakers are installing wireless connections in your vehicles and collecting data, not with your permission. In fact, you're paying for it. It's in the price of your machine. But uh, right now, as we talk, uh, 25 gigabits of information are processed every hour by a modern car. 70% of Americans say they're willing to share their personal data in exchange for um, connected navigation. So if you give me something free, um, then you can tell the world exactly where I'm going and analyze and figure ways to make money off me. And 450 billion to 750 billion is the size of the market for generated data on the cars by 2030. Uh, things like truck trunk sensors that will uh, have a look at what you put in your in your trunk when you come back from the shopping mall and how how loaded it is. Uh, ignition for a free uh, remote ignition. Uh, you're willing to have pop-up ads on your dashboard screen. Um, GSP fast food places will. Uh, pay your car makers for, for your location and then pop up where the KFC's place is where you're driving. Uh, the dashboard, other services, I will tell you where the filling stations and that. So increasingly, uh, you're losing your privacy because it's being bundled and sold to marketers. They're forecasting um, these pop-up ads alone will generate $30 annually per car. Um, and the final little one in here was this innovation I'd like was a tricorder. It's a diagnostic tool, just a little wristband with things on your fingers and things. Um, plug it into your iPad, and it can identify 34 illnesses, including diabetes, fibrillation, pneumonia, and a bunch of other things, uh, and is moving towards 75 conditions, respiratory illness, etc. will all be uh, monitored there instantly and can be sent quickly to wherever it has to go, um, part of the Internet of Everything. And that raises the question, if they can do that, then what about all these little medical clinics that you go get your blood work and things done? Um, will they be out of business? And the final thing I want to talk about is a little subscription to some things here. Uh, we talked about that, I think, already. The armed forces coming in. Um, yeah, the United States uh, blames Russia for cyber attacks on energy grid, but understand we're being poked and prodded all day long, and we're poking and prodding them. The Chinese are very good at that. They have not subject to the conversation right now, but it's taking place. But uh, here we have this taking place, that they're prodding, our, prodding the Americans' uh, electrical grid. Well, very much that's us, too. And if that's the case, understand the electrical grid in North America is very weak and fragile um, and is open for an EMP. We'll talk about more in other classes, and uh, it's quite a concern. Uh, United States and Taiwan, uh, Beijing is uh, very dissatisfied and in a huff that Trump signed the Taiwan Travel Act. 
um, which recognizes American travel officials uh, can have visits back and forth and be recognized for that. But uh, China responds that Taiwan is uh, uh, not a, uh, an independent country, but really it uh, belongs to a, a province of, of China. And so they're not very happy with that, but that may be just Trump's way of saying, okay, I'll back off on that if you give me this, because we are looking at North Korea, we're looking at the East China Sea, South China Sea, and uh, much more on that. The United States is building two aircraft carriers. Uh, that was of interest. Um, but it begs the model. They new, need new metal models. And as you go through this, our aircraft carriers and carrier groups, a thing of the past, uh, they have swarm drones right now, just like little, not even a like dragonfly, smaller. And you simply lock on a face, which is on your Facebook, your facial recognition, uh, your GPS, where you're located, or, or some other way of identifying, and you release 500 of these little drones. Each have two grams of explosive on them, and any one of them can go through a bulletproof vest. And you can't just away from them, they just swarm you. And so multiply that out for a few minutes on these islands that China's building in the East China Sea and South China Sea. Um, put on their 10,000 budget price little missiles and now put one of those carrier groups offshore. No question, the carrier group will shoot down everything that comes up until the carrier group runs out of ammunition. And uh, they don't have 10,000 shots on the, on the ship. So at the end of the day, after they use up all their ammunition, they're still coming. And so, uh, is, is the, our carrier groups, I guess what I'm saying, do they still seem to make sense? And to that end, the Americans are saying they're still short a whole bunch of sailors to equip them and go up to 355 ships. China's got 300 worth looking at. Some exercises take place between the French and the Indians in the sea. Well, I think that's enough stuff um, for you today to look at. You add anything you want to. I'm looking forward to the discussions and looking forward to the course. It's going to be a fun course. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.